I'm sorry. But I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone. The good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. give yourselves to brutes, men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you, you the people have the power, the power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You the people have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie, they do not fulfill that promise, they never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world. Let us all unite! <laughs>
I know all kinds of people who've got this higher self going, practicing their yoga, but they're just like ordinary people, sometimes a little worse. And uh, they can fool themselves. They can say, for example, well, my point of view in religion is very liberal. I believe that all religions have divine revelation in them, but I don't understand the way you people fight about it. You fight and say that uh, we Jehovah's Witnesses have the real religion. Others say, well, we Roman Catholics have it. And the Muslims say, no, it is in the Quran. And this is the right way. And somebody else gets up and he may be a rather highbrow Catholic and say, well, God has given the spirit through all the traditions, but ours is the most refined and mature. And then somebody comes along and says, well, as I said, they're all equally revelations of the divine. And in seeing this, of course, I'm much more tolerant than you are. You see how that game is going to work? Yeah, I could take this position. Supposing you regard me as some sort of a guru. And you know how gurus hate each other. They're always putting each other down. And I could say, well, I don't put other gurus down. See, that outwits all of them. See, we're always doing that. We're always finding a way to be one up. And by the most incredibly subtle means. say, I realize I'm always doing that. And tell me, how do I not do that? I say, why do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be better that way. Yeah, but why do you want to be better? You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. Shall I put it like that? We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs> we white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, British, German, American, have been on a rampage for the past hundred or more years to improve the world. We have given the benefits of our culture, our religion, our technology to everybody, except perhaps the Australian Aborigines. And we have insisted that they receive the benefits of our culture, even our political styles, our democracy. You'd better be democratic, or we'll shoot you. And having conferred these blessings all over the place, we wonder why everybody hates us. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you?
how can you avoid anger? If you're driving in the Kwambitu street, you have to avoid bad drivers, you have to avoid drunken men crossing the street, children crossing the street, all kinds of things. But when you're driving in Kwambitu street, do you have to avoid the moon? No. Because the moon is not on the street, isn't it? So similarly, right now are you angry? No? Then why should you avoid it? There's no need to avoid it. It is just that you think anger is an entity. Anger is not an entity. You become angry. Anger is not sitting somewhere and you go hit it. There is no such thing. You become angry. Human consciousness should create situations. Right now situations are creating human consciousness. That's not the right way to shape human life. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent cover up our mistakes or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. On infiltration instead of invasion on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day, It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no secret is revealed. Government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, that we look for strength, confident that with your help, Man will be free and independent.
the famous, you know the famous saying, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. Which means you look at reality through the screen of your thinking and your judgment, which is conditioned by the past. It's like blinkers, worse than blinkers. It's like look at, looking at reality through heavy veils. And these, so the identification with thinking, believing in your thoughts, having no space outside of the movement of thought. That is the unconscious condition. And then you are burdened with a heavy ego, which is not as an entity apart from thought. It is thoughts that you have identified with. And the first moment of freedom comes when you realize that certain thoughts have been going through your head for years, perhaps, and that they are only thoughts and that you are not the thought, you are the awareness. In my case, I became aware that I had a thought, for example, that started in childhood, one of many negative thoughts I had. Bad things always happen to me. Bad things always happen to me. Your perception then becomes selective. That thought or any thought of that kind actually attracts bad things, negative things. billion neurons in the brain. Okay, there, there are more, each making thousands of connections to other cells. There are more connections in a single cubic centimeter of brain tissue than stars in our galaxy. And yet our inner experience offers absolutely no clue that this is the case. And so, so we're not just slightly out of touch with the material basis of our inner lives. We're completely out of touch with it. I mean, I, I actually think about the human brain a fair amount but it almost never occurs to me that I actually have one. So, so, so we have a, a very limited view of what's going on. We're sub subjectively unaware of most of what our minds are doing. And yet when we think about what, what matters, what matters is consciousness and its contents. That consciousness is everything. Our experience of the world, the experience of those we care about, is a matter of consciousness and its contents. The, the most important question for us is how can we create lives that are truly worth living given that these lives come to an end?
much of what we want in life, much of what we want to experience, entails struggle, and many of us learn to enjoy the struggle itself in some measure. You know, any athlete knows that there's certain kinds of pain that are actually pleasurable. You know, if, if the burn of lifting weights was, was actually the symptom of a, a disease, it would be intolerable. But because it's, it's happening in the context of progress, most people learn to enjoy it. So, so the, the, the conceptual lens through which we view even very intense sensation largely determines how we feel about it. And, and this is one of, one of the many ways in which our thinking about experience changes the character of, of experience. your brain right now. Okay, everyone here is in your brain. Because uh, I am pinching your brain. I mean, th this is consciousness pinching consciousness. So what, whatever you can possibly notice in your body, in your mind, in the world, has only one place to appear in your conscious experience. Now, I'm not saying this is all just a dream. But as a neurological matter, it is very much like a dream. It is a dream that is constrained by inputs from the external world. And the dreams we call dreams at night are, are dreams that are not constrained by the external world. But your, your mind is all you have. It's all you've ever had. It's all you have to offer other people. And that, this might sound callous to say when there, when there may be many other aspects of your life that seem in need of, of being addressed when, you, when you're trying to, struggling to find a career or, or you're sick, but it's still true. If, if you're perpetually angry and depressed and confused and unloving, it doesn't matter how much success you have or who is in your life, you're not going to enjoy any of it. it about society that disappoints you so much? Oh, I don't know. Is it that we collectively thought Steve Jobs was a great man, even when we knew he made billions off the backs of children? Or maybe it's that it feels like all our heroes are counterfeit. The world itself is just one big hoax spamming each other with our burning commentary bullshit masquerading as insight our social media faking as intimacy or is it that we voted for this not with our rigged elections but with our things our property our money i'm not saying anything new we all know why we do this not because hunger games books makes us happy but because we want to be sedated because it's painful not to pretend because we're cowards Fuck
I went to a meeting of geneticists not so long ago where they gathered in a group of philosophers and theologians and said, now look here, we need help. We now are on the verge of figuring out how to breed any kind of human character. We can give you saints, philosophers, scientists, great politicians, anything you want, just tell us what kind of human beings ought we to breed. So I said, how will those of us who are genetically unregenerate make up our minds what genetically generate people might be? Because I'm afraid very much that our selection of virtues may not work. Like, for example, this new kind of high yield grain, which is made and uh, which is becoming ecologically destructive. Well, when we interfere with the processes of nature and breed efficient plants and efficient animals, there's always some way in which we have to pay for it. And I can well see that eugenically produced human beings might be dreadful. We could have a plague of virtuous people. Do you realize that? Any animal considered in itself is virtuous, does its thing, but in crowds they're awful. Like a crowd of ants or locusts on the rampage. They're all perfectly good animals, but it's just too much. I could imagine a perfectly pestiferous mass of a million saints. <laughs> so I said to these people, look, there's the only thing you can do just be sure that a vast variety of human beings is maintained. Don't breed us down to a few excellent types. Excellent for what? We never know how circumstances are going to change and how our need for different kinds of people changes.
what we're doing furiously as fast as we can is exteriorizing the human nervous system into a global organism and uh, what's happening is a lot of people are being left behind or without even realizing it or just opting out and saying you know I can't handle it it's too much to think about I think I'll see what's on daytime TV or I'll buy a newspaper or I'll walk in the park to attempt to maintain the illusion that uh, you know things are as they are things aren't as they are things have already become as they will be the future is now not ahead of us uh, we're there we're there and the only question is where do you position yourself now in this multidimensional matrix Like all animals, human beings want to dominate and exploit the resources around them. At first, we mostly hunted and fished and ate off the land, but then something terrible happened to our minds. We became alone among the animals, afraid of death. great tragedy and an even greater possibility. You see, when we become afraid of death, of injury and imprisonment, we become controllable and so valuable in a way that no other resource could ever be. The greatest resource for any human being to control is not natural resources or tools or animals or land, but other human beings. You can frighten an animal because animals are afraid of pain in the moment, but you cannot frighten an animal with a loss of liberty, with torture or imprisonment in the future. You cannot swing a sword at a tree and scream at it to produce more fruit or hold a burning torch to a field and demand more wheat. You cannot get more eggs by threatening a hen, but you can get a man to give you his eggs by threatening him. This human farming has been the most profitable and destructive occupation throughout history, and it is now reaching its destructive climax.
human society cannot be rationally understood until it is seen for what it is. A series of farms where human farmers own human livestock. Some people get confused because governments provide health care and water and education and roads and thus imagine that there is some benevolence at work. Nothing could be further from the reality. Farmers provide health care and irrigation and training to their livestock. Some people get confused because we are allowed certain liberties and thus imagine that our governments protect our freedoms. But farmers plant their crops a certain distance apart to increase their yields. Are you beginning to see the nature of the cage you were born into? What the big view shows is the all, the all. Everything, everything and everybody is but an expression of something that's universal, the all. However, if I had heard someone say to me the all 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I would have started immediately thinking in abstract, spiritual, mystical terms. Do you know, like, that's what the all is. And the all, actually, it's not something that's abstract. It's not even mystical. It's actually the most evident reality that we simply have become used to dividing life up into bits and we started that very young the first thing you start you'd learned we all learned to divide into bits was you you were the first thing you separated out from everything else in the universe And you did it with your name. When you understood that your name applied to the confines of your skin and bones, you did the impossible. You separated yourself out from the whole universe. You could throw in God just for good measure as well. Do you know? As soon as you got that, not as soon as you got the name, because when you first got the name, you know, you had no idea what your parents were talking about, you know. <laughs> and eventually you simply responded, but you still didn't know what the name meant. You know, a six-month-old infant will respond to the name because they know it usually means something, they're going to get fed or they're getting whatever. But still, it doesn't, there's no identification with that name. But you know, as you get older, by the time you're somewhere between, you know, a year and a half and two and a half years old, all of a sudden the name means the person I look and see in the mirror. That's me. And what feels empowering um, later 
you find out, you start to feel that it's also extraordinarily isolated, alienated. Your very, the very thought of God occurred to you only because you saw creation, isn't it? When you were born and you opened your eyes, you looked around, so much creation. Before you came here, so much has happened. Obviously, you did not create it. So you thought, there must be a creator. This is how you come to the creator, isn't it? The moment you thought there must be a creator, because you're in a human form, you thought it must be a big man. A small man like me cannot do all this. It must be a big man. Just two hands, how can it do so much creation? Must be eight hands. If you were a buffalo, you would be really thinking, God is a huge buffalo. Isn't it so? Yes sir. You go and ask a buffalo and see. A buffalo will insist, God is a huge buffalo. Maybe four horns. <laughs> you know Idi Amin? You heard of Idi Amin? The Uganda man? Idi Amin declared, God is black. I agree with him. If a white man can have a white God, why can't a black man have a black God? But both those people are confused. We know God is brown. <laughs> because he visited us, you know. So dogs will ask, why not a dog god? Actually the spelling also is close, you know <laughs> He seemed to be closer than you, isn't it? So your idea of God is just an, ex an exaggerated version of yourself, isn't it? Your idea of God is just an exaggerated version of yourself. See, you are still not able to define yourself. Isn't it? Whatever definition you put on yourself is not correct. Any kind of definition you put on you, it is not enough to describe this one. The source of creation, how are you going to put a definition on it? You cannot define it, you cannot understand it. You can only dissolve into it.
to most people, the present moment is almost doesn't exist because what they're really interested in is the next moment. So they live always towards the future, towards the next moment. And unconsciously, they regard the next moment as more important than this moment. Not realizing that the future moment that they so desperately want to get to, the end point. They don't recognize that the future has no existence except as a thought form. So when you always live towards the future, you, you, uh, you live your life trapped in a conceptual reality of thought forms. Life is always now. because your life consists entirely of the present moment. And to most people, that's, if, you re, if, you, if you truly realize the significance of that statement, your entire life consists of the present moment. Your life is never not this moment. Even when you remember the past, you can only remember it now. And when you think about the future, you can only think about it now. But people live as if the present moment were an obstacle that they need to overcome in order to get to some better point, which never arrives. So that's a mad way to live. <laughs> and it makes living hard. It makes living into an effort. Many people, I've been in a good many rooms when death came, most of whom regret something. They wish they'd been more kind. They wish they had a few more years so they could live them more wisely. They wish they had searched to, to develop greater happiness or greater insights and had not been buried in professions or trades or in economic patterns that were unbreakable. Very few people, as you know, pass on fully convinced that they have achieved as far as they could what they were here for. But those who do pass along with a greater sense of peace and a greater sense of integrity, 
do they look back upon the kindliness that they have shown. The sacrifices that they have made for others are certainly more than worthwhile. They keep to themselves everything they gave. They lose from themselves everything they kept. It's interesting, uh, the way I've looked at it, is that you go out into the, into the woods and into the forests and you look at trees and you appreciate the trees. You don't say that tree is good and that tree is bad because one tree is fat and one is thin or one is tall and one is short or one is bent and one is straight unless you're in the lumber business. For the most part, you just look at the trees and you, you appreciate them the way they are. They are what they are, and you can appreciate them. But the minute you get near humans, it's interesting that you immediately go into a judging mode. You come into better and worse. And you do that out of your own insecurity. You do that out of your own need constantly to be reassuring yourself. So you're saying that person is got more hair than I do, or that person is is, see, that's the one I picked, so, uh, I wonder why, that, or, or you go into, uh, you find dimensions constantly judging and equating, am I as good as, am I equal to, am I as good a mother, as, am I as beautiful a woman, am I as effective a this, a, a worker, am I, whatever it is, whatever dimension, and you get caught in constantly living in a judging realm. And um, if you start to practice seeing people as trees, you know, in the sense of just appreciating what they are, including yourself, it's just starting to appreciate yourself, appreciate your humanity. Like I'm supposed to be, I'm Ram Dass and I'm, I've worked on myself and I'm supposed to be equanimous, loving, present, clear, uh, compassionate. Oftentimes, I get tired, I'm angry, I'm petulant, I'm closed down. Now, for a long time, I get into those states and I would feel really embarrassed. I would appear like I was warm, charming, equanimous, compassionate, and I, there was deviousness and deception involved. And then I realized that, that is, that's bad business because that cuts us off from each other. And I had to risk my truth. I had to risk being human with other people and realize that what we offer each other is our truth. And our truth includes all of our stuff. And the first thing I had to do was accept my own truth. I had to allow myself to be a human being. 
and um, I think that I was very helped by my spook friend Emmanuel who um, uh, my disembodied friend who when I said to him Emmanuel what am I doing on earth he said why don't you try uh, you're in on earth why don't you try taking the curriculum why don't you try being human and I had always assumed the way to God was to deny your humanity and embrace your divinity and then I realized that the way to truth might be through acknowledging the fullness of where I found myself to be, which was my humanity and my divinity. And not wallow in it, but acknowledge it. And not reverence it or judge it, just appreciate it, just allow it. Allow my humanity. As I started to allow myself to be human more, things changed much faster in me. And then I would start to experience my own beauty. And it frightened me. It was so dissonant and discrepant from the model that I had cultivated of myself over the years, that I had to do good in order to be beautiful. And the idea that I just am that what is, when you look at a tree or a rock or a river, it is in its own way beautiful. I know Laura Huxley, who's a very dear friend. In her kitchen, she has these jars over the sink, and she takes old uh, beet greens and orange peels and things and sticks them in water in these long, beautiful pharmaceutical jars. And then they slowly mold and decay, and there are these beautiful decay formations and mold. And it's really garbage. It's garbage as ours. And we look at it, and it's absolutely beautiful. There's absolute beauty in that. And I've begun to expand my awareness to be able to look at the universe as it is and see what is called the horrible beauty of it. The horrible beauty of it. It's, I mean, there's horror and beauty in all of it because there's decay in all of it. I mean, we're all decaying. I mean, I look at my hand and it's decaying. And it's beautiful and horrible at the same moment. And I just live with that and with that I start to see the beauty in it. So we're talking about appreciating what is. Not loving yourself as opposed to not liking yourself, but allowing yourself. And as you allow, it changes.